Welcome to FBC. Thanks for tuning in. We pray that you will allow God's Word to speak to you, to encourage you, and transform your life. Thanks for watching. So as you're standing there, I would like you to turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I'd like to give a shout out to the West Wing. Everybody say, yay, West Wing. Uh, they're joining us by simulcast in our 1045 service today, but uh, we want them to know we're, we're glad to be joined up with them today. Well, in John chapter 3, in the next two months, we're going to be talking about some uncomfortable conversations. And these are conversations Jesus had with people, ordinary people, a variety of people, and they were uncomfortable for those people. But in many cases, as the people respond to what he had to say, they were life-changing for those people. So today we're going to talk about Nick at Night, the story of Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night. So John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which is the Jewish word for teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus had been doing miracles, and it got Nicodemus' attention. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. You may have a seat. And this passage we're going to look at today, this uncomfortable conversation, draws out the question that is highly significant, and the question is this, have you been born again? Have you been born again? Where were you born again? When were you born again? Is there evidence to show that you truly have been born again? Are the members of your family, have they truly been born again? And uh, as we talk about that, the bigger issue in some ways is, well, what does that even mean to be born again? So let's look at the context of this story, this uncomfortable conversation, and then we'll begin to answer those questions. Like I said, you could call this Nick at night because Nicodemus goes to Jesus at night, and he does so because he's curious. He's been hearing about this rabbi from Galilee, who starts doing these crazy miracles, healing people and turning water into wine. It's crazy, but it's controversial, and he's curious. If Jesus is a fake, it's his job to silence him. If Jesus is real, then there's an issue going on here because that would mean he's the Messiah. So he's meeting Jesus at night because he doesn't want to draw any attention to this meeting. And it's during the Passover, the annual Passover holiday. So there's people all over town from all over the world. So in the hubbub of all of that, he's hoping nobody will notice that he's meeting with this rabbi. And he's doing it very carefully because in his mind, he has a lot to lose. He has a lot of power. He has a lot of prestige. He has a lot of popularity. He has a very high position so he's very cautious about meeting with Jesus at night. And the thing that's really got his attention is, as a Pharisee, for him, everything was about religion. What man had to do to be right with God, religion, rules, rituals, religion. But Jesus comes along, and he's talking about God in a different way. He's talking about God in the form of a relationship, a relationship with God, relating to God out of a relationship that is a gift of grace, undeserved. And so he wants to find out what is really going on with Jesus, and maybe that's you. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you, you come because you're curious about Jesus. You've heard about him. You want to see if he's legit. Maybe you are like Nicodemus in that not only do you want to intellectually understand what Jesus is about, but there's something going on in your heart. There's this hunger 
this thirst that if there is this type of God and he does want to have a relationship with me, then what does that look like? In this setting, Jesus cuts through everything else and immediately says, Buddy, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Now, that had to shake Nicodemus up because he thought that he was in a pretty good place when it came to seeing the kingdom of God because he was all about religion and he was highly religious. And he didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said, you got to be born again. And so in verse 4, he asked the question, how can anybody be born when he's old? Um, He asked, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? This doesn't make sense. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless somebody's born of water and of the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom. of not, he can, not only can he not see it, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Whoever is born of the flesh is flesh. Who's ever born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be amazed that I tell you that you must, not maybe, not, you must be born again. The wind blows where it will. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So is everybody born of the spirit. That brings us back to our questions. Have you been born again? Do you know, do you know for sure that you know that you know that you have been born again? That there was a time, there was a place when you experienced this supernatural birth from God. And let me ask you, what about your family members? Have they all truly been born again? Jesus said, of everything else I can tell you, you got to be born again if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to experience eternal life in heaven. You say, okay, Dave, so what are you talking about? What does it mean to be born again? Well, first of all, let's talk about what it does not mean to be born again. What does it not mean to be born again? Sometimes it's easier to understand something if you understand what it isn't. If I know what it isn't, then it helps me understand what it is. What does it not mean to be born again? Well, number one, being born again does not mean being religious. That's pretty obvious here. It's not being religious. Nicodemus already was religious. Jesus is not going to him say, you've got to be religious. He's already religious. He had, he, he had all the boxes checked. First of all, he was a Jew in the first century. Of all the people on the planet in the world at that time, the Jews were some of the most religious. God had given them ten big rules in the Old Testament to govern their lives. And then to help them flesh that out and create a working society... He gave them 603 more rules to explain how to live out those 10 rules. So they had 613 rules in their religion. They were religious. Now, let me just say this. Rules in and of themselves aren't bad. I'm glad in my neighborhood that there's a speed limit. I don't want somebody driving through my, down my neighborhood street 75 miles an hour. I want there to be a rule that tells them drive 35 miles an hour because I don't want them to hurt themselves and I don't want them to hurt me <laughs> or anybody else in the neighborhood. So rules, good rules are good because they protect us. So it's not bad that God gave rules, but he gave a lot of them in the Old Testament, and the Jews had to try to keep up with all those rules in their religion. And Nicodemus did all that, but he did more than that. He not only was a Jew, he was a Pharisee. Now, there was a select group of Jews who were Pharisees, and what they thought was, well, we want to make sure that we don't we not only don't want to cross the line, we don't want to even get close to the line. The word Pharisee means separate. We want to separate ourselves from anything that's going to break one of these rules. 
or anybody that's going to break one of these rules. And so they were a whole group of Jews who were extra religious, the Pharisees, and Nicodemus was one of those guys. And so they added hundreds of rules to the 613. They had over a thousand rules that they tried to keep up with. Doesn't sound like much fun to me, but but Nicodemus was more than a Pharisee. He could check the Jew box, the Pharisee box, but he also was a ruler of the Pharisees, which every Jew knew meant that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 70 most religious Jews on the planet. Sanhedrin means 70. So he was one of the 70 most religious people on the planet. He was already religious, and Jesus did not say, well, it's an honor to meet you, sir. Your religion is outstanding. Jesus said, listen to what I got to say. You're not even going to see the kingdom of God if you're not born again. That was uncomfortable. Say ouch. That was an ouch for Mr. Nicodemus. Essentially, what Jesus is saying to him, listen, is your religion, even though God gave this in the beginning, in and of itself is not good enough. You need to be born again. Now, I want you to think about this. If you're planning on getting to heaven because you are religious, if you're planning on having a relationship with God because you are religious, you need to rethink that. Because here's one of the most religious men on the entire planet, and Jesus says to him, sorry, not good enough. Not good enough. You talk to people all the time. Well, well why do you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, I was baptized. I grew up in the church. I go to church. I do this, I do, and they talk to you about their religious things, which are all good things. But in and of itself, religion is not going to make you good enough to merit a relationship with God. The question is, have you been born again? Look at me. Let me tell you about my friend John. Kathy and I were first married. I was pastoring a little church out in the boondocks in Virginia. And uh, there was a, a young couple there that we hung out with, and John and Jeannie. And John was super religious. He was a Sunday school teacher. He drove a bus and picked up kids from a bad neighborhood and brought them to church on Sundays. He was a deacon. He was there in Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, clean the church day. He was there all the time. Very religious, but nothing on the inside. He wasn't a bad guy, but I mean, he had, he had anger issues, he had porn issues. Started praying for John that, that his eyes would open and realize that just being a good uh, Baptist wasn't going to get him anywhere with God. And one Sunday, at the end of the talk... <laughs> John came down, and I remember him looking at me and saying, I am miserable, I am lost, I need to be born again. Amen. And he got down on his knees, and he gave his life to God. He admitted his sin. He put his faith in Jesus, committed his life to God, and John changed. He got up, a new man, and he's been a new man ever since. I actually saw him about four months ago. I was speaking in Virginia at a thing, and John is a member of the church where I was speaking at, and he came up to me and he said, Dave, don't, I tell you this every time I see you, wherever you go, tell them you must be born again. Amen. Jesus said, buddy, you got to be born again, and it's not your religion that's going to get you there. Being born again, second, does not mean just being good. Being good. I've asked a hundred people this question. If, if, if you were to actually die today and you stood outside the gates of heaven and God said to you, why would I let you in? 
what would you say? And a lot of people say, well, I'm a good person. And I always say, are you good enough? And they never like that. And often they will say, well, what does it mean to be good enough? Or usually they will say this. They'll say, well, I'm better than so-and-so. I remember being in a prison, and I said, if you died, would you, would you go to heaven? And this guy said, yeah, man, I'm a good person. Said, We're in a prison. He's a prisoner. <laughs> I said, what makes you say you're a good person? He says, well, I'm not like the people over in the D-dorm. They're the murderers and the rapists. We're just the arm, arm robbers and stuff in this, this one. Everybody thinks they're going to get in because they're better than somebody else or because they've done a few more good things than bad things. But that's not in the Bible. Being born again is not about being good. And it, it shakes people up when they realize they're not good. And they'll say, well, what does it mean to be good enough? And I, What is good enough? And I say, well, what's good enough for God is perfection. Absolute, 100% perfection. God is perfect, holy, without sin. Heaven is perfect, holy, without sin. You've got to have a righteousness about you that is perfect. One time I was talking to a guy, and, and this has happened more than once, and I said, well, if, what basis would God let you into heaven? He said, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. I said, good deal, name them. He said, well, I said, well, just tell me where they're at in the Bible. He's like, I don't know. Well, listen, if you're planning on getting in by keeping the Ten Commandments, you really ought to know what they are. Amen. And if you don't even know where, what they are, you ought to know at least where they're at. By the way, let me ask you a question. Can you name the Ten Commandments? You don't have to answer that. Do you even know where they're found in the Bible? They're found in Exodus chapter 20, because if you look on your notes, it says that right up there, see. <laughs> Let me paraphrase them for you. Worship only God, only God, nobody else, nothing else. Do not worship anything else as a God, including yourself. That gets most of us. Don't misuse God's name. Prioritize God at least one day a week. Honor your parents. Do not murder or even have hateful anger or bitterness in your heart towards someone else. Don't have sex or lust, lust after anybody other than your spouse. Don't steal. Don't lie. No lusting at what you don't, after what you don't have or what someone else does have, like a car or a relationship or a house or a hobby or a trailer or a vacation spot or a position or a career or whatever. And the, 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 the trick is you got to keep all ten of those absolutely perfectly every second of your life to be perfect. So if you're counting on getting in by keeping the Ten Commandments, there better, has not, there better not be a moment when you didn't keep those perfectly all the time. Amen. You say, well, who could do that? Well, there was one guy that did. Yeah. And his name is Jesus. Are you good enough in the eyes of God? Well, this is what God says about how good we are in ourselves. He says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there's no one righteous, no, not one. None of us hit the bullseye of righteousness. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, if you're a Bible circler, circle the word sin, and let me explain that word to you. There's, there's ten words for sin in the Bible. This one is a Greek word that means miss the bullseye. And picture a big bullseye, a big target, and there's a, a bullseye. And then the next ring around the bullseye is called, in the Roman understanding, sin number one. The next ring around the bullseye is sin number two. The ring around that is sin number three, and you keep going. Sin number four, sin number five, and maybe you are an incredibly good person, and so you could say, my life, I've only ever messed up a few times. I'm, 
the first just missed the bullseye. That's sin number one. Maybe your life isn't all that good, and you say, I'm not even close. You're sin number 187. The problem is, if you miss the bullseye, it's sin. And God says, for all of us have sinned, missed the bullseye, and come short of the glory of God. I used this illustration once, and a lady in the lobby came out and said, I want you to know, young man, that I, re this was a few years ago, I resent you calling me a sinner. I said, well, have you ever sinned? She said, well, a time or two, but I don't think that means you should call me a sinner. I said, well, how many murders does it take to be called a murderer? She said, one. I said, so how many sins would it take to be called a sinner? She said, well, uh, I don't like you calling me a sinner. Her husband said, can I say something about her? <laughs> Look, if you're counting on getting to heaven by you being so good, you better be perfect. Some of you are sitting here and you're going, Dave, you've kind of rocked my world a little bit. You say being religious isn't going to get me to heaven. Being good isn't going to get me to heaven. So what it does it mean to be born again? Good question. And by the way, before I answer it, let me tell you this about the bullseye. There was one person that hit the bullseye. Amen. His name was Jesus. Amen. And he, he just... just just because, just because he kept all 100, 613 rules of the Jews, but he hit the bullseye. He not only fulfilled the Ten Commandments, he filled out the Ten Commandments. He not only uh, didn't kill his enemies, he loved his enemies and prayed for them. So there was one who hit the bullseye, and what makes him such an amazing person, listen to me, is even though he never sinned, he earned the right to have a relationship with God, but because he loved us, he took all of our sin upon himself and the penalty of our sin upon himself and died for us and then rose again from the dead to prove that it was a legitimate payment for our sin. Amen. It hit me one day when I was thinking about this. If I could get to heaven by being good... Why did Jesus have to die for me? If I could get to heaven by being religious, why did Jesus have to die for me? Because being religious, you're not going to be religious enough, and religion in itself is all about what you do, and Christianity is a relationship that comes because of what Jesus has done. He took your sin. He died on the cross. He tore down the wall of separation between you and God. You see, the problem with sin is it's like a brick. Every sin is like a brick between me and God. And that separation, when we die, becomes eternal separation. God and heaven on one side and us and not heaven on the other. Judgment on the other. But Jesus, because he never sinned, when he died and rose again, he tore down the wall of separation so that we can have a relationship with God. It's not based on what we have done. It's based on what Jesus did. And when we receive what he did for us, that's what changes everything. So let's talk about, let's take the rest of our time, let's talk about what it means to be born again. What does it mean to be born again? Number one, being born again means experiencing a second birth, a second birth. Verse three, Jesus said, unless someone is born again, a second time. Nicodemus was getting that part. He said, can a man enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? You see, you're born physically. But you need a second birth. Something needs to happen to you after that point. Something needs to occur in your life. You need to experience something. You need to be born again. I've met a lot of people that have said to me, well, Dave, 
I've been a Christian all my life. The question isn't that. You grew up in a Christian family. Thank God you grew up in a Christian family. But when were you born again? When were you born the second time? When did you experience that second birth? The second thing about the second birth is being born again means experiencing a spiritual birth. A spiritual birth. Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus is contrasting physical birth with spiritual birth. He says you've got to be born first of the water and then of the Spirit. Now, some people mix baptism in here, and I don't think that's at all what he's talking about. When a, when a woman is pregnant, there's water that the baby is, the fluid that the baby is, is encased in. When it's time for the baby to come, the water breaks, right? And the baby comes out all wet. That's being born of water. That's a physical birth. And they fill out a birth certificate when you're physically born. They put the date and the time and the place. Jesus said, you need a spiritual birth as well. It's not that you've always been a Christian. That you had a physical birth, you grew up in a Christian home, good for you, but when were you born again? Flesh gives birth to flesh, physical birth. Okay, that's happened to all of us. Spirit, God's spirit, gives birth to the spirit, your spiritual birth. I saw a bumper sticker one time, it said, born once... That's good enough. The problem is, Jesus would say, nah, nada. Not good enough. You need a second birth. Jesus said that first birth is insufficient. You see, why do we need a second birth? Because the first birth is tainted by sin, and we have a sin nature. We have a propensity to rebel against God, break God's rules, do our own thing, not worship God, worship ourselves, worship something else. We, our first birth is insufficient. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have children? How many of you think one day you might have children? How many of you have heard of children? <laughs> but there are these things. Okay, let me ask you a question. Did you have to teach your children how to do bad things? Or did you have to teach them how to do good things? You had to teach them how to do good. Why? Because they could naturally figure out how to do bad things. We had three boys that were gifted at that. I never, you never, th they don't cover this in any parenting book. When you leave them with a babysitter, we come back. The babysitter's tied up. And it's like, you never told us we couldn't tie up the babysitter. You come back, the babysitter's like, I'm not doing this again. Why? Well, they got up on the roof. Well, you never told us we couldn't get on the roof. I remember one uh, evening, our kids were six, four, and two. And we bowed our heads to pray. And I'm praying, and I hear, <laughs> and I look up, and here's food flying across the table while we're praying. Kathy's like, stop it. What are you doing? And then she turns to me, and she goes, Dave, what is wrong with these children? Well, a couple theology degrees kicked in, and I said, honey, theologically speaking, they're sinners. <laughs> they are sinners. And that's a fact. And so are you. And so are I. So am I. 
That's why we must be born again. That's why you must be born again. Thank God that you think good things about Jesus. Thank God that you believe there is a Jesus. Thank God you believe that Jesus died for sins. But you need to be born again. Jesus said this about our sin, our life without being born again. He says, the spirit gives life, but the flesh counts for nothing. It doesn't add up anything towards being right with God. Romans 7 says, I know that nothing good lives in me, my sin nature, that is in my sin nature, for I have a desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. I try to do good, but it doesn't last very long. I don't have the power within me. Listen to Galatians 5. It says, when we follow the desires of the sinful nature, the results are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. If all you got is your nature, which is tainted by sin, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. What do I do? You've got to be born again. So the being born again is a second birth. It's a spiritual birth. The third thing is it's a supernatural birth. It's a supernatural birth. Jesus answered, he said, I, I assure you, unless somebody's born of water and the spirit, you need a spiritual birth, a supernatural birth. He can't enter the kingdom of heaven. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is to everyone born of the spirit. You know, I've, I've been there when people have been born again, and you don't see the spirit of God visibly coming on them. But the people that get truly born again, you see the results of it in their lives the next few days. Amen. The person's different. They have different desires, different wants, different wishes, different thoughts, different attitudes. They become different. Two final things here. Experience, being born again is the result of experiencing the supernatural tug of God. You experience a supernatural tug of God. John 6, no one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's this tug of God, this sense, God, God is doing something. I've had people, I've heard, you have, we've heard people describe it as, as Jesus knocking on the door of their heart. They feel it, they sense it. People describing um, Jesus with his arms out, pulling them in. The love of God reaching out to them. When I was born again, I felt I had this big bag of, of bad on my shoulders. It was weighing me down. All of my sin, I was just, just being crushed by my sin, and I wanted out from under it. You experience the supernatural tug of God. Some of you online, in this auditorium, in the West Wing, since I've been talking, you've been experiencing the supernatural tug of God. He's drawing you to a relationship with himself. What do you do? The second thing is this. Being born again is a result of responding to the tug of God's spirit. It's when you respond to that tug that you are born again. John chapter 1, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, you got to open your life up to him. He gave the right to become the children of God. They're born again. They become the children of God. To those who believe in, they're putting their faith and trust in his name, Jesus. They are born Born again, not of blood, the first birth, not of the will of the flesh, the first birth, not of the will of man, but of God. 
John 3, 16, you know this verse. God so loved the world, God so loved you that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, puts their faith and commits their faith to him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, you're willing to go public. Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You're saying Jesus is the boss of my life from now on. Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a response. You call on the name of the Lord. You cry out to him. You admit that you, yes, you've sinned. Yes, you need to be born again. You believe that Jesus, yes, Jesus never sinned. Jesus died for you on the cross. Jesus rose again from the dead. You call out to him to save you, to forgive you, and you commit your life to do, right? From now on, I'm going to do what you want with my life, God. I'm going to do what you want with my life. And when you mean it and God is drawing you and you're responding to that tug, you get born again. Amen. Look at me for a second. I'm going to tell you what... what the first time I felt that tug of God, I was like seven years old. I was sitting in a church. We were visiting a different church because my dad uh, loved the guy that our former pastor was preaching at that church, so we went to hear him preach. And he was telling about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, and I sat there, and I felt the weight of my sin, and I felt the drawing of God, and I didn't know what it was. I was so uncomfortable that in the middle of the guy's talk, I jumped up and I ran out the back of that church. And uh, unfortunately, nobody talked to me about it. Thankfully, several years later, I was sitting in a church service like this again, and the guy that was talking was talking about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and us needing to be saved. And I felt that big weight of my sin again on my shoulders, but I knew more this time, and I said, I'm going to wait it out, <laughs> and if this continues, I'm going for it. And when the guy got done, I, instead of running out the back, I ran to the front, Amen. and I got down on my knees, and I said, I, I, I want to be saved. Uh, for those of you that have been born again, you, you have a similar story. But it, for all of us, it's when we responded to the tug of God by receiving Jesus in our lives, believing in Jesus, committing our lives to him. If you never really responded to the tug of God, today is the day. Just like there's a physical birth certificate written out for you somewhere and you got it in your safety deposit box or whatever, there could be a spiritual birth certificate written out for you today in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Yeah. Today is the, day. the old song says, a new name written down in glory and it's mine. And the amazing thing is, you change. <laughs> if you get it, you get it, right? Amen. You change. You're different. Well, we don't know what Nicodemus did that night. Although we do know at the end of the book that he's come around and he seems to be a follower of Jesus. Thank God. But this uncomfortable conversation tells us how we can have eternal life and how we can have a relationship with God. we got to have a second birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's a supernatural birth. And it's available when we respond to the tug of God. The Spirit of God drawing us. Now, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads, and I'm going to ask you to be very still for the next few minutes, if you would. Just be still. <laughs> 
If you've been born again, pray for people that have not yet been born again. And if you're experiencing that tug of God and you're not absolutely certain that there was a time and a place when you were born again, you responded to the Spirit of God, let's make today that day. And let's make this that place. Right now, why don't you say to God, God, I admit that I have sinned. I admit it. I have sinned, God. I admit it. I admit that my religion is not good enough. I believe Jesus died for my sins. Say it to him right now. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose again to give me eternal life. I put my faith in Jesus Christ right now. And now say to God, I call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. Come into my life Forgive my sins. I want to be born again. Change me. I want to follow you the rest of my life. Thanks for watching today's message. If you have any questions or comments or if you made a decision for Christ, please reach out to us at info at firstgc.org. That's info at firstgc.org. Thanks again for watching.